We'll move on to our uh, final speaker before the break, which is uh, Mike and Jensen, who Start recently thank you. <laughs> joined, um, uh, moved from, I guess, uh, uh, Harvard, from Boston to Copenhagen mm -hmm. to start as a professor here. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. And um, I think it arrived 10 minutes in my inbox after I registered for attending this conference and listening to all of you. So <laughs> I don't know if that works in the future, but <laughs> stay tuned. So um, I'm going to follow up nicely on Andreas, who, even though uh, he talks about what can we do with biomarkers and how can it be used in the doctor's office or for the clinician, if we want to move a little bit further upstream to the actual prediction of disease, uh, we really are going to have to focus a little bit more on samples or biofluids that are available in people who are not patients. So in this case, I am specifically going to talk more about uh, developments for the non-invasive biomarkers. And I'm also going to shift from a lot of interesting talks yesterday on um, longevity and the promise of life, a uh, longer lifespan for all of us to talk about something that might be of concern for all of us as we age, which is the, the, the danger of losing our minds or not preserving our cognitive health. So I'm going to talk more about dementia today. And um, by training, I'm an epidemiologist and I'm really trying here to take some of the interesting biology also uh, that was discussed yesterday into population-based testing. So to see, can this really be used to say something about your risk of disease? So a related disease that we already have done this for is coronary heart disease. If you go to the doctor today, maybe particular in the US, um, you get a variety of biomarkers measured in a panel and we use this to estimate your 10 or 20 year risk of developing heart disease. So it's pretty known already that um, we have this cholesterol deposition in the arteries and we've quickly found out that we can take the cholesterol and divide it into the bad LDL, which higher levels are associated with a higher risk of heart disease, whereas HDL has this inverse association. So when you have higher HDL, you have a lower risk of heart disease. So for, heart dis um, for LDL, this was pretty uh, straightforward because we already have statins when we take statins or the patient takes statins, we lower their LDL and we also lower their risk of heart disease. So we know it's causal. This has really not been that straightforward for HDL. And so this is something that we've been struggling with in my research group for quite a number of years. In epidemiology, where we don't have a specific intervention that can alter just that one biomarker without affecting other factors, we sometimes use this um, concept of uh, studying the naturally occurring genetic variants. And we call this Mendelian randomization study because this is given to you upon birth, which we also heard this morning. And so maybe you can appreciate here like, um, that what we consistently see is that if you are genetically predispositioned to have high LDL, um, this is also um, associated with a higher risk of heart disease. So in that case, uh, the, the data matches. This is not the case for, uh, for HDL. So when we combine uh, many different genetic variants uh, to make a polygenic risk score for seeing are you genetically predispositioned to have high HDL, you don't have a significant lower risk of heart disease. So this left, le uh, led to many um, companies to actually leave the field right away, even though HDL is the next interesting thing to, to work with since we already fixed LDL, couldn't we get something else we could intervene on because we still have this residual risk in heart disease. So some of the explanations are really beyond the statistical techniques that we apply in epidemiology and, and really is why I had to train in a, in a lab, basically, and learn more about what's, what, what are we doing when we apply this in an epi design. So um, what's pretty straightforward is that LDL, while it's not a protein encoded by one gene, 
the common thing for all LDL is that there's one ApoB per LDL. So it's pretty um, simple and it's uh, a very important protein. This is not the case for HDL. HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. So it's the lipoprotein that has the most protein and the least lipid in it. So over 100 proteins have already been identified on HDL. Um, and so this is the HDL proteome. The so one thing um, that we do know is that often it has APOA1, but it's not a one-to-one -one as it is for LDL. Um, and it's not one single protein that's always on HDL. Sometimes it's APOA2 or another apolipoprotein. protein. So this is different. Um, and so this um, the, the associated protein cargo of HDL is really what explains the downstream fate of HDL, whether or not it's able um, to interact with different proteins or enzymes downstream. And so this has um, kind of developed into a new field of trying to capture the functionality of HDL rather than just the levels. Um, so the most focus has always been on uh, reverse cholesterol transport. Our purported um, that um, HDL could take cholesterol from the periphery and re remove it through the liver. It turns out to be um, a very small proportion of the cholesterol. But there are all, of the, all these other functions of HDL that potentially are even more interesting, but completely overlooked because we happen to classify HDL as a cholesterol transporter. So um, in my world, HDL is much more than a cholesterol carrier. And so we have uh, created a research focus on not just HDL levels, but really the function. And I also believe that these functions and um, the entire uh, proteome of HDL could explain why we now see HDL playing a role in a host of other diseases other than cardiovascular disease. But just to take a step back for heart disease, what we did for function was start out with a focus on apolipoprotein C3, which is a, a protein found on some of the lipoproteins, a minor percent, like 10 to 15 percent of VLDL, LDL, and HDL. It's a pro-inflammatory protein, and we knew in just lab studies that when APOC3 was on HDL, it wouldn't do one of its main functions, which is to diminish inflammation. So we developed this new ELISA in the lab downstairs with Jeremy Fortado, where we basically just took APOA1 from plasma in our large population-based studies and separated according to whether or not it had APOC3 or not. And then we associated with risk of heart disease in our um, internal case control studies that are basically patients free of, or not patients, subjects, research participants free of heart disease at baseline that we follow over time. So during over six years of follow-up, this is now uh, recently published, we actually had to go through four study populations and five years of work to measure these uh, samples. You can see we had to go to almost 3,000 incident heart disease cases to have enough statistical power to show that we could take total HDL and separate it out so that only HDL, HDL that does not have APOC3 on it was associated with a lower risk of heart disease, whereas the HDL with APOC3 was not associated with lower risk, perhaps even dysfunctional. So it didn't really do what we expected to do. So indicating that if you go to your doctor and your doctor says you have high HDL, it's, it's the good HDL, depends on your proportion of HDL between these um, to um, APOC3 or not. And so since then, we actually went and applied this to a range of cardiometabolic diseases. And while I don't expect for you to see all of these estimates, we basically found the same thing. Um, so HDL with APOC3 did not uh, confer the protective risk. In a paper accepted just last week, we have systematically gone through the entire HDL proteome of the 100 proteins on HDL that were consistently found through various mass spec methods to exist on HDL, which resulted in six, development of 16 new ELISAs. So those are the only ones that resulted in a subtype of HDL that had a high enough level where you could measure it in the lab. And so here we started our work and seeing that we could extend it even further to, for instance, whether or not APOE levels 
only in, in HCL was modified by APOC3, which it also was. So there's no association for heart disease for just APOE, but when APOE was found without APOC3, it was protective. So this could sort of, we can sort of see this as a way to sort through some of the inconclusive results in the literature to see that actually the, the protein cargo matters. So a uh, sub-conclusion here was, as I said before, that we really see that HCL has a role beyond just cho uh, carrying cholesterol. And um, we have looked at this for all these cardiometabolic diseases until uh, um, someone from NIA came and said, what about HCL and dementia? And um, this is maybe eight years ago. I had not worked in dementia, but, uh, but um, I started looking and uh, I actually was working on genome-wide studies. And we noted that a range of the hits in, Al in GWAS of Alzheimer's are actually uh, proteins that are present on the HDL. So this was a very low hanging fruit. Also turns out the brain is a very cholesterol dense tissue. And in the literature, we, po uh, we popularly call the cholesterol in the brain as if it's transporting HDL sized lipoproteins without any clarification of what that means. Because the, the brain actually synthesizes APOE itself, and so APOE is not crossing the blood-brain barrier. Um, so this is not a fun non-invasive marker right now, because we're talking about the brain. But we also know that APOE4 genotype is the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's. And there had been some studies on plasma APOE that weren't conclusive. So why would plasma have anything to do uh, with what's going on with the with the brain. So this really started our hunt for um, early markers of dementia. Um, and it's related to this um, kind, of, um, in the, um, kind of discussion we're having in the dementia field right now, thinking that all of the patho pathology really occurs decades before we see the actual disease. So um, we're currently still discussing and developing measures and techniques for the actual diagnosis of uh, dementia. But what I'm talking about is going either further, further upstream of this in participants where we could have a plasma sample and say something about their risk. So just a word of caution about this research field. Um, because I come from heart disease and then I start to work on dementia epidemiology and I notice that it's actually very different. Um, and there's a paucity in the data and there's a reason that we don't have good biomarkers. So a quick example would just be here where you can see a study um, with over eight, 28 years of follow-up. So basically at all the way out here on the right, we have, um, but da, da, um, here, this is when the actual disease was diagnosed, but uh, you can see that about a decade, so around eight, um, 12, uh, 12 years before, the curves are shifting. So before that, obesity is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, but about 10 years before, uh, pa future patients already start to lose weight. They don't know they're on this trajectory, and 10 years later will develop dementia, but that's what happened. So very few have this kind of data. If you look in a cross-sectional study, you would have a high risk of what we call reverse causation. You would conclude that low weight is a risk factor for dementia. In fact, this was published by the UK Biobank last year. Um, but if you actually had the data to look in midlife, you would see that that is not the fact that is uh, making the wrong conclusion. So we really need um, really good population-based data. And this requires uh, careful thinking as well as a uh, biobank if you want to look at biomarkers. So these are complexity that um, means that this field is very young still, but also where sometimes I find that the relevance of my work in terms of risk prediction may be a little bit premature because we're really still discussing what is, what is dementia, how do we diagnose it, do we care about cognition, do we care about beta amyloid and tau. Nevertheless, we went ahead and looked at it so we thought that with uh, prospective studies, we could have a look at whether or not these associations of plasma APOE um, could be made clearer. Um, so like I said, 
the problem with looking at total plasma E is, first of all, you don't take care of the fact that sometimes it's on the bad LDL, sometimes it's on the good HDL. And we already had found that this is very important for, um, to take uh, into account the protein cargo. So we went and developed uh, new assays just focusing on APOE in uh, HDL in plasma and made subspecies based on the top hits from GWAS, so APOJ is clustering, which was the second hit beyond APOE4. And um, we studied this in um, two prospective samples in the US. One is the cardiovascular health study, and the other one is the Ginkgo um, memory trial. We had six years of follow-up. Participants came in every six months, had a mini-mental. If they had any um, lower cognitive score, they get a full uh, clinical um, adjudication. And um, so it's a clinical dementia outcome. And at the end of the Ginkgo study, we also had MRI and PET scans of the brain. So these were our aims, and um, we're finally finished. This was really work led in Boston by postdoc Manya Koch. So what you see here is first that uh, we did find that total um, APOE was associated with better cognitive function, just like had been uh, published in the literature. But when we split it into uh, APOE that was and was not in HDL, we found that this association could largely be explained by APOE in HDL alone. We also looked at the risk of dementia. It was same, it was inverse for risk of dementia for APOE in HDL, but not really significant. And that's also why I put the number of cases here, because I told you before for heart disease that we needed to go to 3,000 cases before we had statistical significance. So while we can point to it, we cannot say what would happen unless we had more data. We then looked at subspecies. So in this case, it's APOE in HDL and whether or not it had clustering, the other hit. Um, so clustering itself, it looked like would not render the APOE protective. It was better when there was no APOJ on it. There was higher um, scores on both the mini-mental and um, the reverse for the ads cock. And the same for um, dementia. We also find that in the absence of APOJ, APOE was good. We repeated our previous studies for APOC3 as well for dementia, just to sh see, and it showed the same as for heart disease, that only when APOC3 was not present was there an inverse association for cognition and similar for dementia. We just had a quick look also at the PET scans. I'm not gonna show you the MRI data today, but um, we see again here that the HDL uh, that the, there's an inverse association, so less beta amyloid in the brain if you had APOE. And this seemed to be mostly related to APOE in the HDL part. And then lastly, we had a look at um, these apolipoprotein protein subspecies in plasma versus CSF. The most common uh, question from reviewers is whether or not this has anything to do with what's happening in the brain, and clearly, APOE does not cross, we knew that already, but we just wanted to see if any of the subspecies in plasma would have a stronger correlation. And we did actually find that sometimes it mattered what it would transport across with. Um, so in summary, we found this inverse association and because we didn't see anything for APOE um, in HCL uh, without APOC3 with the uh, um, a beta that I showed that I didn't show you. We actually were thinking maybe this is mostly re related to the cardiovascular pathology. There are so many crossing points for the blood-brain barrier where HDL might play a role. At the same time, the omics, which we also heard about before, it's having a very different approach at this, and it's going um, forward really fast. So this paper is not uh, some of our work, but it's made up of omics across eleven studies. This is cross-sectional. But after doing metabolomics in that number of data, um, they actually end up concluding there's something about HDL. We don't know what it is, but HDL is related to dementia, which we already could have told you. But it does beg the question, where, where do we go now? And so I'm happy to follow up with Andreas, as Matthias Mann is also a mentor of mine. And so 
for sure, I think the future direction would be uh, non-targeted pr protein uh, profiling here. We could discover new markers in prospective settings. I'm hoping this will allow us to look beyond A, beta, and tau. Again, perhaps sometimes you could say it's premature as we're not really clear on even what disease we're um, we're looking at. And this is also why we did a, a comparison at first of the protein profile between CSF and plasma, uh, which turns out basically no comparison, or <laughs> at least it's very hard. We're talking thousandfold uh, level differences in the expression. But the hope is we could move forward with some of this now also that I'm in Denmark, um, I will be moving from plasma to tissue. So there's some translation relevant there as well. This is just the recent published paper looking just at the CSF and seeing what proteins we can distinguish. And we actually did uh, publish here between, um, we had Alzheimer cases and control and CSF. For me, CSF is fun because it's a fluid, but it's still not non-invasive. I hope that we will see a future at some point where we could go in a doctor's clinic with a plasma sample, just like for heart disease, and we don't have to risk anything. So the hope is to continue this. We just got funding for Mania to start uh, plasma protein profiling in the cardiovascular health study. So we have uh, 5,000 samples now, and uh, these are all of the endpoints we will be able to look at. And so with that, I just want to thank everyone who's been part of this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pagan. That was really fascinating talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience to begin with? Maybe people posted it on Slack. There are a number of questions here. Um, let me see. Um, so I have, a, I have a question myself. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I missed it, but what is the mechanism behind the APOS C3 effect? In, in, in the cardiovascular. In, in the cardiovascular. It is pro-inflammatory in itself. So whether or not it's, um, I think there was some, there's been various purported mechanisms from just, these are cell studies. Mm -hmm. um, with that, was it, uh, is it TNF1? We could just see, like, there was an expression of the inflammatory markers, whether or not they were down-regulated or not. And these were cell studies. So after we did our epi studies, no one has really followed up on the biology. I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> someone might, someone should. I know that there's, so there's a APOC3 antisense now. I see. Being okay. developed ah. specifically for triglycerides. Uh -huh. And so triglycerides and ACL are yin and yang. Mm -hmm. um, our results are independent of adjustment for triglycerides, but for sure, um, this is, this is um, actually a collaboration also with the lab because they're interested. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, so there's a question from Wilbert Vermey. Yes. Did you also have a look for APOE4 versus APOE2 effects as APOE2 is associated with longevity? Yes. So we unfortunately only have the genotype data. Mm -hmm. I, we haven't really been able to find which ELISA would work best for the types. Mm -hmm. I'm actually excited for proteomics there too, because right. they find the isoforms. But when we stratify by genotype, obviously we see what he's mentioning. We don't have enough E4 carriers to be able to tease them out. But we can look and see that for anyone who carries a two or three, the results are I see. same. Um, and thinking about the um, the, uh, I have a question about the samples and, and so, I mean, there are, I guess, other ways to get samples from patients like buccal swabs and things like that. Yeah. Is that something that you're thinking about maybe with the single cell proteomics that Andreas is uh, doing or? Yeah, uh, for the, in Denmark? In Denmark, for example. Because we did buccal cells in Boston. Um, oh, we have that for I see. We I do see. have GWAS. That's was my postdoc, yeah. but then I yeah. thought this slipped to something <laughs> more. <laughs> um, but yes, and we have, of course, the, the petal bank with all the different tissues, right. and yeah. I'm trying to see where, yes, that 
I have to do this switch in my head between yeah. plasma to tissue and realizing that once we have tissue, uh, it's a patient of some kind or hopefully you don't yes. go give a biopsy. Right. So that's why we're starting to look more at disease progression rather yeah. than risk of disease. Yeah. So it takes away a little bit of the prevention angle. Yeah, that's very but, interesting. I think maybe we have time for one more question. Um, so there's a question from um, Ben Wu. Sorry if this question is ignorant, but do you think that focusing on cholesterol, a single digit risk factor for heart disease, as compared to age, which confers coronary risk factor in excess of 5,000, could potentially be limiting as aging biology may have greater pathophysiological relevance? Those of us more familiar with geoscience hypothesis might have seen Laura Niederhofer's conference that highlights the distinction. Yeah, as it is interesting, APOC3 is one of the genetic variants known from the Askanasi Jews ah, for longevity I see. and different mutation. Yeah. Um, so it's not far from, of course. Of course, it's, you could say it's naive to focus on one part of biology, but... Um, I mean, I we guess that's to, how it is when you want to, I mean, what really happened was during my PhD, everybody left the field of HDL and said yeah. HDL is dead. And that is based on some statistical extrapolations, but there's still interesting biology there yeah. because it's still our single strongest risk factor for heart disease, yeah. accounting for AIDS, of course, but AIDS yeah. predicts everything so, so far. So how do you feel about statins? Statins. I feel conflicted since returning to Europe. I see. <laughs> in America, we drink it in the... <laughs> in the milk. <laughs> I see. Don't yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, let's give uh, Mike another round of, round of applause. And thank you very much for your interesting talk. Thank you.